Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, if you can hear me kindly chat box, may uh, reply to them please. All right, fantastic. Acha, uh, let's just wait for like two, three minutes and uh, then I'll start, inshallah. Okay. अभी आवाज आ रही है आप लोगों को डॉक्टर आयशा डॉक्टर शाहजमा जी सर बिल्कुल आ रही है चलिए ठीक है बस एक वन एक मिनट बस वेट करते हैं देन आई स्टार्ट इंशाल्लाह राइट सर जस्ट टू डिक्रीज द बैकग्राउंड नॉइस सो एवरीबॉडी कैन हेयर मी क्लियरली आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट टू म्यूट देयर माइक्स प्लीज Okay. Uh, I think it's good a time as any to start. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everybody. Uh, I'm very grateful for mashallah 74 of you uh, electing to join and participate in this uh, webinar. Thank you all so much for giving me your time and attention. Um, today, uh, this webinar was basically uh, born out of my own interest and uh, passion for uh, radiology and uh, 
I'll uh, start off by confessing one thing that I, since I'm not a radiologist uh, myself, I am I am basically a student like all of you. But uh, this was something that just uh, uh, grabbed my interest because this is a subject that has not been uh, taught to us at an undergraduate level. Uh, at least uh, KP mein to ye hal hai. I don't know uh, what is the situation in the rest of the country. Uh, so and. When you get out of your undergraduate life and you're opening your clinics and everything, then suddenly you are just faced with uh, how to get x-rays, how to develop them, how to understand them. So this is something that is quite uh, deficient, at least that I found uh, with regards to teaching my own students. So I thought it would be, uh, let's make use of this time that we have and you know, let's try to uh, understand uh, dental and oral and maxillofacial radiology to the best of our uh, abilities. So I'll just uh, start off by um, giving you an uh, introduction about what is oral and maxillofacial radiology. Well, the American Dental Association has defined it as a specialty which is concerned with the production and interpretation of images and data, which has been produced by all modalities of radiant energy. And these are used for the diagnosis and management of diseases, disorders, and conditions of the oral and maxillofacial region. Now, uh, it is a recognized dental specialty in most uh, countries. I think Pakistan is an exception to this uh, because of the fact that there is no dental or oral and maxillofacial radiologist in Pakistan. And uh, for this reason, uh, at least our dental colleagues are uh, somewhat dependent on uh, maxillofacial surgeons to interpret x-rays. And uh, we surgeons are also quite dependent on our uh, medical colleagues in the specialty of diagnostic radiology to help us out uh, when we uh, are taking, uh, advising patients for CT, MRIs, PET scans, and ultrasound, etc. So this is a specialty which is not, uh, had, which uh, hasn't yet taken roots here in Pakistan. And uh, this is something I tell my students who are uh, just about uh, to uh, finish their house job that uh, you, you know, you can go for the major clinical specialties or you can go to it basic sciences. Or if you are so inclined, you should try to pursue a specialty which does not exist here at the moment in Pakistan. And uh, you can be a trendsetter in that regard because uh, you will have no competition and uh, you know the world uh, will be your oyster in that regard. So anyhow, uh, oral and maxillofacial radiology or dental radiology, this is centered around four basic tenants or principles. The first tenant is obviously the uh, usage, maintenance, and operation of x-ray equipment and image receptors. The second pertains to radiation protection. And this just, just doesn't apply to uh, your patients who are you, whom you are exposing to the radiation, but also applies to you, the doctor, as, as well as your auxiliary staff. Uh, the third tenant is radiography and the fourth one is radiology. Now you may think that these, the last two ones are maybe interchangeable, but they are not. Uh, radiography is basically the production of X-ray images. And uh, in Pakistan, usually this is done uh, by uh, technicians uh, who are operating those uh, machines. So uh, that is basically radiograph. We call them radiology technicians over here, but maybe the more correct term would be a radiographer. And radiology basically is the interpretation of those images for uh, the purpose of uh, medical diagnosis. So that is the difference between radiography and radiology. So just to give you a brief uh, introduction or a history of uh, X-rays, they were discovered in 1895. They are a form of high energy electromagnetic radiation and they comprise of millions of wave packets of energy which are called photons. 
They are generated by the tube head portion of the X-ray machine and when produced inside the X-ray, when these high energy electrons bombard a target, that causes them to be suddenly brought to rest and uh, all that kinetic energy of the electrons is then converted into X-rays. The fellow you see on the top right is the inventor of X-rays. His name was William Longton. Uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name. He was basically German. And he basically invented X-rays. And uh, the picture you see underneath that, this is the tube head portion uh, of the X-ray. Uh, Uh, sorry, uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the beginning, uh, since this uh, webinar is being conducted from a free Zoom account, you may uh, find the meeting finishes at around about the 40 minute mark. So if uh, don't be alarmed, just give me a minute to restart the meeting and then you can join it again, inshallah. So I hope, uh, because I don't think I'll be able to finish this in uh, 40 minutes and obviously I want to uh, put in some time for any questions uh, uh, for a question answer session with you guys as well. All right. Now, this is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum of this. You can see that this small portion is the portion that we can see with the human eye. This is called visible light. On its left is ultraviolet radiation, and this portion over here, X rays, this is what we are interested in and what we'll be talking about uh, today. So how is the X-ray beam generated? So let's talk a little about that. Now, most of you must have seen this. This is what a typical X-ray machine looks like. This is a wall mounted unit. So you can see it has four portions. One is the control panel. This is the extension arm, which helps you to uh, direct the tube head portion. Uh, towards the direction or angle that you require and this is the cylinder. This portion basically this generates all of the x-rays and this is just to uh, help you around with the angulation and position of the tube head. So let's since this is the tube head this is the portion which is going to be generating your x-rays so let's go inside the tube head and see what it has. Now, there are several components of the tube head. Uh, the main component of interest is basically this X-ray tube, which is connected to two sets of transformers. One is called a step-down transformer, one is a step-up transformer. This whole uh, X-ray tube is enveloped uh, inside uh, with oil. And uh, these broken beams which you see, these are basically X-rays, and they pass to two things. One is called the collimator, and one is your aluminum filter, and this is a spacer cone. And uh, since this portion is generating X-rays, it is generating X-rays in all directions. So you need to uh, somehow focus or limit the X-rays uh, exiting this tube head to just this portion over here. So in order to protect the patient, to protect the doctor, the auxiliary staff from X-rays, this whole tube head portion is uh, closed around in a lead shield so that any x-rays which are exiting this tube head are only from this portion over here. Now, like I said, the main thing of interest to us is this x-ray tube over here. So let's uh, zoom in to this and see what we have. Now, this is the glass tube which generates the x-rays. So, uh, for the generation of X-rays, you need a filament, obviously. So the filament used to generate those high energy electrons, that is basically made of the element tungsten. So this tungsten filament is placed over here. This is connected to a step down transformer. We have a focusing device over here, which helps to limit the electron spread to just in this area over here, instead of making it, flooding the whole uh, glass tube and these electrons are focused on this area called the target. If you remember in my earliest slide, the electrons generated over here are brought to collide with this target and when they collide with this target then x-rays are produced. 
and we have a copper block over here as well and this copper block basically what this does is helps with the heat dissipation uh, so I'll, let's go ahead to how the x-ray beam is generated so like i said earlier uh, this is your glass tube so we'll first focus on this portion uh, you when the filament of the uh, the tungsten filament is basically connected to a step down transformer and this in turn is connected to your main voltage. So the main voltage over here that you have is about 240 volts. So that is a lot of voltage and uh, because we don't require such a high voltage uh, because we just want to heat this filament, we don't want to melt it or anything. So this, uh, the main voltage is then connected to a step down transformer to decrease the voltage and that decrease voltage will help to produce a low value of current. As you know, the uh, unit of current is amperes. So we don't want a current in amperes, we want a current in milliampere. So what this will do, the step down transformer will decrease that main voltage to produce a low value current, which can just cause the heating of this tungsten filament. Once this tungsten filament is being heated, so you know heat is a form of energy, that energy is transferred to electrons and uh, with the production of heat, those electrons are generated and uh, it helps to uh, create a field of electrons in this area, all right? So that focusing device, again, it is helping to keep the, this uh, sea of electrons generated in this area only, okay? Now, you will notice that the filament and this uh, tungsten target, it is connected by another transformer, which is called a step up transformer. Now, you know that electrons flow from an area of low voltage to an area of high voltage, and creating such an area requires the production of a potential difference. So, earlier when we needed to reduce the main voltage from 240 volts, now we need to increase that main voltage so we can create a potential difference in this area. So for that, we will need to increase that voltage. For that, we need a step up transformer to increase that voltage. So once we create that potential difference, all the electrons generated over here will speed up and will try to hit this target, which is called the tungsten target, okay? So when it hits uh, this area over here, so that will result in the production of X-rays you can see like in the form of broken lines over here, okay? So obviously when high energy electrons are uh, hitting a target, that will result in not only the production of X-rays, but also in the production of heat. So if you are continuously taking X-rays, you may ask that now where is all that heat going? So in order to help with the heat dissipation, we have two things which help us. One is a copper block, which is connected to this tungsten target. And this helps to drive away the uh, heat from this tungsten target towards the copper block. And another thing that we have is the oil, which is uh, just outside this glass tube. And this also helps with the heat dissipation, okay? Now, as you can see, the X-ray beams are now flowing uh, outwards towards the spacer cone, towards the patient. So here we have two, three structures over here as well. One is the collimator and one is your aluminum filter. The collimator, what it does is it helps to change the direction of your X-rays to make them all parallel. As you can see, these X-ray beams are currently divergent. So the collimator will help to focus this X-ray beam and make them all parallel to one another. Okay, that is the function of the collimator. Now, what is the function of the aluminum filter? Now, the aluminum filter, basically what it does is that the X-rays that are being produced, they're all not of uniform nature. Some of them may be high energy, some of them may be of low energy. So if you allow the low energy X-rays to pass, what will happen? That they will go towards the patient and since they have low energy, they might just be able to get into the skin but will not be able to go towards the bone or towards the teeth uh, of which you're trying to take an X-ray. 
so it does not help you uh, does not help with the image generation rather it just increases the overall radiation dose that you are giving to the patient so what the aluminum filter does is it helps to absorb those low energy uh, x rays so they are not transferred to the patient and they result in overall reduction of the radiation dose which is given to the patient all right uh if this is too much physics for you i know it may seem a bit uh, overwhelming at first so what i've done is on the next slide i am going to play a short video for you so let's just hear that the cathode is your x ray filament basically अच्छा आप लोगों को आवाज नहीं आई ओके हाइंग ऑन आई एक्सप्लेन इट अलॉन्ग द वे देन इन दिस केस ये द कैथोड दिस इज बेसिकली द एक्सरे फिलामेंट इट इज जनरेटिंग दोज इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एंड दिस इज द टंगस्टन टारगेट all right which is also called the anode so all the electrons are striking this target over here so once it is going to be hitting this anode this will result in the production of x rays which you will see in a moment in the form of uh, purple uh, cube uh, purple arrows all right so along with x rays it is also forming heat which you will see in the form of a red dot over here all right so in order to dissipate this heat this anode is rotated so you can see now that the point where the collision is occurring is continuously changing and it is moving away from the collision point so the heat can be dissipated so this is a video of took from youtube all credits go to the university of queensland for uploading such a simple video anyhow uh i hope that the uh, up until now you uh, everything is clear and uh, you don't have any queries uh, as such and in case you do you know you can just put them in the chat and i'll try to answer them in the end okay so this is how basically an x ray beam is generated so let's uh, uh, try to talk a little bit about x ray uh, equipment uh one thing i should tell you that uh, i'm not going to go too much into the physics of it i uh, the intention of creating this webinar was more towards uh, addressing the practical side of uh, x rays how we can benefit them uh, while we are practicing in the clinics or in our dental hospitals so i probably won't be going too much into the physics of the stuff it will be quite uh, maybe generic in that regard okay so let's talk a bit about x ray equipment the and in this case i'm specifically talking about dental x rays so the first thing that we need that is your x ray film or your image uh, receptor and the second thing we need is your x ray beam generator which i have already showed you so what are the types of your x ray beam generators Okay. 
So what are the types of your X-ray beam generators? You can have floor supported models. They can be wall mounted or they can be handheld. So you can, you've probably seen them uh, in your hospitals or in your clinics. Uh, this uh, floor supported one used to, uh, these are the older models. Uh, they obviously take a lot of space because this pedestal is quite huge. So if you have limited office space, probably you would, uh, it is more likely you will opt for this wall mounted model. And uh, recently you are having these handheld models as well, uh, which increases the portability of uh, the X-ray. So, and it has, every model has its own advantages and disadvantages. Obviously I will not be getting too much into that, but you should know that what type of X-ray beam generators are available in Pakistan and uh, which ones uh, do you think will be more useful for you? So just uh, revising the structure of an uh, X-ray uh, beam generator, like I said before, you have a control panel, you have an extension arm, you have a tube head. I've already explained what the tube head is and how it generates the X-rays. There's nothing in the extension arm. It's just to uh, accommodate your angle and direction. But uh, there are a lot of things in your control panel. So let's see a control panel may kya kya hota. I'll just increase the brightness so you can see all the buttons on the on, on this figure. In the control panel, you have a lot of options. You will you might have a main switch which uh, turns the X-ray on or off. You may have a timer or you may have an exposure time selector, which is over here. It means for how long you want the X-ray beam uh, to be generated or for how long you want the patient to be exposed to the X-ray. You may have warning lights on, which uh, might tell you that the X-ray beam is about to start. So you should uh, evacuate any unnecessary staff or patient attendants from the, uh, from the area where you're taking the X-ray. You can also have a patient size selected. If you focus here on the right side, you can see that the green is, uh, light is on right next to an adult size symbol. And below that, you can see that there is a, a, a button which even allows you to take x-rays of children or uh, children or pediatric uh, patients. So this are also, uh, also uh, sorts of uh, uh, adjusts your uh, dose that you give to the patient because obviously for children you need a smaller dose for adults who need a larger dose. You also have a kilo voltage selector which is given right here. Dental x-rays usually operate between 60 to 90 uh, kilo volts uh, and uh, you might also have a milliampere switch which is over here given by this MA signal. Uh, typically x-ray machines require a milliampere of five to 10 milliamperes. That's what they usually function with. And you may also have a film speed selector. I'll get into what is a film speed uh, a bit later. Uh, and then we have a participant who is requesting. Uh, uh, the participants are already muted. Uh, and uh, Dr. Aisha, can you hear me? I think uh, I just saw a message where you're saying there is no voice. Were you talking about the video or are you talking about me? Okay. Okay, fine. Chale. Let's move ahead. So the, basically these are the uh, options that are available. Uh, on the control panel of your X-ray. You can also see that for individual teeth, you have individual uh, selection options for them as well. You have, uh, here you have the one for your anteriors, your premolars over here, upper and lower, and uh, upper and lower molars. This is in case you want to take a bite wing, uh, so, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, we'll be, this meeting will be finishing in 10 minutes. So uh, if it finishes, like I told you before, just give me a minute to restart it and then we'll proceed uh, further, inshallah. Okay, 
So what are the types of film that we have that we use for dental x-rays? You have digital film and you have plain radiographic film. Now, I'm sure most of you would have seen at least one of these. And uh, this is the one that, uh, these are your radiographic films, which we use uh, mostly in our dental hospitals and some people still use them in their uh, clinics. And uh, this one and this one, these are your digital films, okay? So basically, uh, first we'll talk about uh, radiographic films since it's already being used uh, in quite a lot of your dental hospitals. I don't think they're, I think there are very few hospitals who have gone completely digital uh, in this regard. So most of them are still uh, require, uh, uh, most of them are still using plain radiographic film. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Amara is asking a question. Chill a chota question, so I'll answer it right away. Uh, children need a lower dose of radiation because uh, in addition to x-rays, uh, uh, in addition to x-rays being required for uh, imaging, uh, they are also capable of producing uh, changes in your DNA. And since children have are in a growing state and have a lot of cells which are rapidly proliferating, so there is a higher chance that you may cause uh, cancerous change or malignant change in their cells. So that's why you need to give them a lower dose to decrease the chance of DNA mutation. It doesn't have anything to, uh, the density of the bone uh, can play a part as well, but obviously the, uh, you have to protect your patient uh, as well. You may have heard of a principle of radiation called ALARA, which is A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, as low as radiographically appropriate. So that's why you need to uh, limit the dose as low as you can in order to get the best possible image while also protecting the patient from the harmful effects of radiation. Okay, so radiographic film, uh, the one which is still being used, it is the traditional form of taking x-rays and it has two types. Uh, one is uh, the direct action film, which uh, we use for the intraoral x-rays, and we have an indirect action film, which uh, we use for extraoral x-rays. Now, uh, extraoral x-rays are predominantly, at least I can tell you about KP, that almost all of them have become uh, digital films, so these are not really used uh, nowadays, and since I'm not going to be talking about extraoral x-rays today, so, uh, we're just going to be discussing intraoral x-rays, so you can put indirect action films out of your mind. Um, for the time being. Uh, we have a participant who raised her hand. Uh, like I said, uh, if you can just put your questions here in the chat box, I'll try to answer it, them in the end. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, coming to the film sizes. Uh, again, we have another participant raising their hand. Uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat box and try to answer them in the end, inshallah. All right, Dr. Sairish, same goes for you. So please just put your questions in the chat box. Okay, so we have uh, three types of uh, x-rays, uh, film sizes. Uh, the first size of A, which is 22 by 35 millimeters. This is usually used in the pediatric patients because uh, they don't, uh, their mouths usually don't open that much, so you can put in a full size B uh, x ray. And uh, obviously, the vestibular depths are also not that, uh, 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 not that large uh, or not that deep that you can put in a full x ray like that. Uh, they also cause a gag reflex if you put in a large x ray into their mouth. Children are usually not very cooperative with intraoral x rays. So, the A size or the 22 by 35 millimeter size is the one usually used. Uh, for uh, children. The B size, which is 31 by 41 mm, this is the one used for adults. And C, which is your 57 by 76 millimeters, this is the size that is usually used for occlusal x-rays. Okay, so all this time I've talked about film, let's talk about what is actually inside the film. So, this is a, how a typical X-ray film looks like if you open it. So you can see that the outer packet, it, does, it is basically put in an outer packet, which is your number one. 
it uh, may be green like this or it may be completely white or it may be multicolored so this is the outer packet uh, of the x-ray you can see that uh, company ka naam is likha hua and uh, i am i'm sorry i couldn't find it better picture where sometimes it is also written what is the speed of the film but i'll come to that in a minute then you have a black paper which is your number 3 over here and number 3 over here this basically helps to protect the x ray and all the salts and everything that are put on top of the x ray and you have a lead foil which helps that uh, whatever x ray radiation is going to pass through the x ray does not pass out through the back side towards the patient so it is a, in a way uh, it is protecting your patient uh, from uh, protecting the patient's other tissues which may lie which may lie in the line of the x-ray but you don't want it to go towards them so the lead foil here in this case this uh, number 2 this will basically absorb all that extra radiation and number 4 over here this is your x-ray film you may be confused that it is green x-ray film is the way when we see it it is usually black but an unprocessed uh, film which has not been exposed to x-rays that is usually green in color so why is it green so let's come to the parts of this x-ray film this green portion i'm just going to be talking about the green portion now why is it green so it has several layers but the only layer i want you to focus on is this emulsion layer which is uh, and this emulsion is basically a silver salt a silver salt of the halogen series your chlorides bromides iodides this is this is your halide series of your periodic table so for the emulsion we basically need a sort of silver most companies usually use silver bromide as an emulsion and i just want you to remember silver halide that's it don't focus on the uh, rest of it just remember silver halide because x ray development is all focused on this emulsion layer all right okay so when you're going to be taking the x ray how are you going to orient it well uh, i'm sure everybody of you knows that if you palpate the x ray you at one end you will feel a raised dot so this dot is raised to one side and it is depressed on another side and uh, this raised dot side is placed towards the x ray beam towards the tooth and the depressed side is away from the tooth and even when you once you've developed such an x ray uh, once you're processing it the raised dot should face the dentist all right so this is the raised dot this is taken from an unprocessed film but in these uh, in these pictures the raised dot will be towards this completely white side okay so if you cannot feel this dot another method of knowing which side the dot is it is towards this side over here okay this is the side towards which the lead foil is placed so you are not going to face put this side on towards the tooth this has to be facing away from the tooth all right okay i think we have one minute left over here so there were a couple of people who were asking their questions so if you can uh, if you can have one or two of those questions so then i'll when i restart uh, i'll start from uh, optical density if you can please put your questions here you can try to answer them quickly this raised dot uh, raised dot wali jo side hai wo basically aapne uh, it has to be towards the tooth this raised dot uh, jo hai na ye aapko bata raha hai ki kis taraf lead foil nahi hai because if you push that lead foil uh, side towards the tooth then your x ray will not come clear uske upar aapko patches patches nazar aayenge because x ray beams cannot pass 